Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is KC Wang, and I'm a co-PI on the Fabric project. Uh, thank you all for joining us today for the first installment of our Stitching Together Innovation with Fabric Users uh, webinar series uh, featuring Professor Nick Sotana today. Next slide, please. Before we begin, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items. The webinar will include a live question and answer Q&A session right after the presentation. Uh, please note that uh, the chat feature is disabled. So at any point, if you have a question, just feel free to type it into the Q&A box right at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will answer it during the Q&A session. Finally, this webinar is being recorded, so it will be shared with all the registrants after the webinar. Next slide, please. Today, we're joined uh, by our presenter, Professor Nick Sotana. Professor Sotana is an assistant professor of computer science at Illinois Institute of Technology. He develops networking techniques to improve cybersecurity and research infrastructure. Before joining Illinois Tech, he was a postdoc at UPenn after completing his PhD at Cambridge University. In 2024 and 2023, he received Visiting Scholars Program Awards from the University's Research Association. And in 2022, he received a Google Research Award. So now I will welcome Professor Nick to start his presentation. Hi, hi, thank you, uh, Casey, for the kind introduction and hello, everybody. Um, so my plan for today is to tell you about how my group uses Fabric. And along the way, I'll tell you about the kind of features that we use in our research uh, so that that can possibly serve as an example of uh, for how you might want to use Fabric for your research. And during this talk, I'll build up towards giving you a demo of Fabric usage. Um, in which I'll show you a research prototype that's running on Fabric and it uses some of those features. <clears throat> so in terms of the topics we're gonna cover, they'll be centered on programmable networking, which is my area of research interest. Within that field, uh, P4, um, a data play in programming language, which I'll tell you about, plays a very important role. And indeed on Fabric, uh, you find great resources and support for P4, there are software tools, programmable hardware, as well as uh, a variety of documentation and recipe examples that you can emulate and build. So in the course of this webinar, I'll give you examples of using P4 on Fabric, and um, I'll walk you through a P4 program that you will see running on Fabric um, in the demo at the very end of this um, webinar. So to begin with, let me tell you a bit about how I got started with Fabric. So, I started using Fabric a little after I started my faculty job here. And I was looking for resources in which, um, using which I could do research. So as you know, research requires a variety of different ingredients. You need ideas, both the sensible kind and the wacky kind. You need plenty of patience. Uh, but in my field, you also need hardware resources because the way in which uh, research is evaluated in my field and goes running experiments, and those experiments need to run on resources. Right? So this is a bit different than if you were doing most theoretical work, for example. Um, so I was looking to you know, initiate my research program and find a job, and I needed resources, and I, I had a bit of a chicken and egg problem in the sense that there was no chicken, there was no egg, and I was starting from scratch. So I looked around to see what kind of um, infrastructure I can use, and I came across Fabric. Um, and you know, as any engineering-minded person, I had my set of requirements in mind, right? You always start with requirements. So um, my, my requirements were basically, I wanted to use hardware resources that were reliably accessible, you know, they weren't uh, oversubscribed, and, and that provided enough flexibility of configuration to enable the research that I wanted to do. Because oftentimes in research, you need kind of primitive access, you know, very low level access to infrastructure in order to uh, push the ideas envelope, so to speak. What I found in Fabric, however, was additional features on top of that that made it a very productive environment in which to do research. And 
also in which to train students along the way and, and eventually also as a platform for, for teaching. So um, as, as by way of examples of, of such features, you know, that, you know the, 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 there's a fairly low friction sign up process. The, I, I love the API driven approach that it has. So you can program it, pro programmatically control the infrastructure. As you'll see even in today's webinar, right, it's a great uh, platform for demoing research. And as I found out later, also for teaching. Um, students, I find, um, I find Fabric to be enriching because of the level of detail that they can get when using that platform. That, this level of detail is tunable, right? So um, students who are still starting out can have a lot of the detail abstracted, but then as they become more advanced, they can get more exposed to uh, the underlying dynamics and also be able to control them. Um, and finally, uh, there is a, a supportive community, right? This is a, a joy that you know, if, if you're running into problems, obviously you try your utmost to solve them yourself, but there is a, a whole body of knowledge that has been accrued over time. You can learn out from other people's problems, right? And, and so, so in the form of you know, the forums and, and also the network shop, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to engage in that sort of spirit. Finally, uh, the platform is extensible in a way that I'll show you during today's webinar. But that is to say, you don't just use the resources and run experiments on them, but indeed you can extend how Fabric looks and feels to you and to other researchers. And um, this is something that we were particularly uh, interested in recently as we we're building a kind of a research project on top of Fabric that, that extends it in this way. To begin with, let me tell you a bit about programmable networks. It's, um, it's an area that I find absolutely fascinating. So the paradigm, the way of thinking in programmable networking is that the network isn't just a passive conveyor of bits between endpoints. Rather, the network is more of an active participant and it can potentially change and redirect the information as it's traveling through the network. And you can do this in hardware. So what you can see on the right of the slide here are two bits of hardware. The top one is a, is a programmable switch. And uh, so, so for every single frame that enters the, the switch, uh, you can have a very short program that runs on that at a very high rate, a throughput. And below that is a programmable net, the network kind. Um, so both of these photos were taken in my lab. And, um, you know, this is commodity, commodity equipment. And um, so, so these days it, it's, it's fairly accessible and provides a great platform for research. Now, what you can see on the left of the slide is an example of a topology um, that is very heavy on switches. So these blue spheres you can see at the top, those are switches. And these uh, mustard colored cubes at the bottom, those are servers. So you don't need a topology like this to get a lot out of programmable networking, but I'm using this as an example of the kind of complexity in switching that programmability can help you navigate. So what, what we'll look at here is, um, kind of the, uh, we're gonna see a stream of traffic that's gonna be crossing between two servers, so two of those cubes at opposite ends of the diagram, and they'll, they'll be crossing the network, so they'll be passing through those blue streets. And you can see that the spheres, they, their color darkens as they're handling traffic, right? So, so they have some, something in their queue, so their color darkens in that way. And you, you'll see, because of the dark mode of the color, what the path of the traffic is as it's flowing through. Now, before we, we progress, let's see, let's think a bit about how non-programmable networking works, right? And, and what kind of we're drawing back to that example to, to see what, what um, flexibility that true programmability is. So, the way no programmable work, networking works is um, typically a frame shows up at the port, a switching decision is made, and the frame is going to be uh, egressed on, on another port. Um, and the switching decision is done by, based on simple but very fast computations, so, so lookups and, and very fast updates. And what happened over time is that the degree of the kind of lookups and the type of updates and the type of computations that people sought uh, increased, right? So there's that saying, you know, if someone an inch, you know what to put, right? So um, that, the combination of that was Hi, Nick. before. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, some audience uh, heard some statics uh, muffling your voice. Is it your headset? Is, is that better? Yes, now it's better. 
Oh, sorry for that. Um, so uh, the, the culmination of that uh, trend was in the full-fledged programmability in, in the data plane, right? Albeit, um, you know, not that it's not going to allow you to do to run a spreadsheet on your switch, um, but it's it's going to do it's going to allow you a lot of flexibility when it comes to uh, packet processing. So P4 um, is, is a programming language uh, that recently won uh, the SICOM Test of Time Award. That, that's, a, that's a big deal. Uh, so this is an award given for impactful research. Um, and I, I'll just read the citation for, for this award. Uh, but so by creating a higher level protocol and platform independent programming language for packet processors, P4 changed how we think about customizing and reconfiguring the behavior of packet switches. And it's developed in the open, so you can download the, the, the specs. And there are also open source tools that you can use for this. So the, the way P4 works is that it allows you to embed a program inside the, uh, the, the stator plane or, or forwarding plane. And you can then interface with this program within the switch or, or remotely in order to influence how it behaves. But this program will be executed on every single packet that crosses the data plane. Okay, so now you know, with, with, with the same hardware, we can reprogram it to work in very different ways. So the, the switch, uh, switches that we saw earlier in our network, in this case, what we're doing is we're making use of path diversity in this topology so that uh, the, the network is going to afford two paths for, for this, uh, for the traffic, right? So you can see, um, this, the, the traffic following different paths, different switches are being activated until they ultimately converge here to, to reach that server. So that's, that's one example. Um, another example is where we can use even more um, you know, fancy routing schemes, forwarding schemes, depending on you know, what, what, what we seek to do. Um, uh, depending on the, the nature of the problem we're solving, you know, the workload. So in this case, this is you know, a, a very different type of forwarding scheme, as you can see by the activation of the switches, um, how different it is from what the, kind of the very orderly uh, example we saw earlier. So, so programmability enables you to control this to a degree that's uh, much higher than it was before. Um, we're not using programmability. Now, of course, there's a fly in the ointment because as we all know from experience, wherever there are programs, there are gonna be bugs. So in this case, I'm gonna show you an example of what a bug might look like in this case, um, uh, in, in this setting. Um, so we have the same topology as before, and we see that we kind of have a sync situation, right? So there's this like equivalent of an infinite loop. The switches get very dark because all this traffic has been concentrated there and kind of it, it gets trapped there uh, as a sort of attractor. So the, 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 the problem is that, you know, pro programmability also opens up a surface of, of debuggability that needs, uh, need, needs attention, it needs tooling. So, and this is still a bit of a, of a problem that needs a solution, right? So we, we have techniques to debug individual uh, elements, individual you know, switches and NICs, but um, we lack kind of network-wide debuggability tools. And so, so the, 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 the message of this webinar and kind of the, the, the pre for program I'll show you, the examples I'll show you, are kind of be built around this theme, right? That's wherever there are progr problem, programs, there can be bugs. So having debug debugging tools is absolutely essential. And then we step back to think how can we build those debugging tools? And you know, from experience of having debugs many programs or different architectures, we know that debuggability um, is something that's enabled by observability, right? You have to see how the problem, how the program is working, um, be it directly or indirectly, in order to see how it deviates from how you intend it to work. Right? And for those of you who are interested, you know, this is a, a subset of the of working with distributed systems that are known to have very complex behaviors. So why is Fabric a great fit for this research? Um, so one, um, uh, and, and here I'm focusing on, on some elements more than others, right? So this arrow here as a bullet means it will feature more in the stock, but, but, but I find them all extremely important. So 
So one, one element of Fabric's great fitness for this research is the degree of support for programmable networking. Over the years, there's been a lot of contributions by various institutions, as well as by, by, the, by, by the Fabric team themselves to uh, enable uh, and the, the programmability um, and support it in the form of um, you know, recipes and, and you know, API extensions and so forth. And so amongst these, you'll find contributions by the University of South Carolina, Northeastern, UMass, and Illinois Tech, and ESNet. Another great aspect is uh, recipes or examples of fabric experiments to start from. You don't have to start from a blank slate. You can start from examples that you can learn from and, and bootstrap from. Another uh, important aspect is performance, um, because logic is important, but in, this, in the field I'm in, performance is also a very important thing to consider, right? So being able to run experiments uh, that not only show correct behavior, but also show correct behavior at a high rate is, is essential. Another thing that we find very important for automation, reproducibility and repeatability in running experiments uh, that sometimes take many hours is, the API driven nature of Fabric. Um, so that, that we find is, is an absolute asset in our work. Um, another aspect is extensibility. So this is something that I'll, I'll tell you a bit more in the coming slides. And, and this is extensibility in which we extended how Fabric behaves and appears um, from the user side without having to change anything on the Fabric side, right? Because we, we do not have any control on that. Uh, but what I find found especially um, pleasant is that this extensibility involved less than a week of work to create the first prototype, right? Which is, um, you know, it's nice to have that velocity at the speed of thought when it comes to um, having a prototype match, match your vision, right? What you'd like to realize. Uh, and finally, the measurement uh, framework, which, which is something that I, I won't go into much in, the, in this talk. Um, uh, it, it shows up in one of the projects I'll talk about, but it's it's something that is which we're increasingly making more use of. So we're tackling this problem in two ways. So the first project is patchwork. So what this does is it's uh, it allows you to get visibility across the data plane on Fabric on all its sites. Um, so we have a paper that uh, describes the initial approach to this, and since the paper was published, we've, we've done a lot more work. Uh, to extend it and, and improve its performance, improve its variability, improve its features. Um, so so we'll, we'll be uh, making public more work related to that. And within that project, the use of P4 is to offload filtering, sampling, and truncating, etc., um, to be done in the network at a, at a much higher rate than if we were to rely on microprocessors to do that. And there is ongoing work related to integrating with uh, the measurement framework uh, in order to uh, improve the visibility that we have, not only in the data plane, but also uh, conjoined with uh, what can be seen in, in, in metrics uh, related to infrastructure and fabric. The second project, which I'll tell you more about today, is Crease. So while Patchwork looks at the data plane, Crease looks into the programs, the programmability, programmable elements themselves, and they complement each other, right? The data plane provides you with the result on the network, whereas Crease looks at how that, re that result is being uh, computed. So Crease stands for causal reasoning and attestation for scientific experimentation. And the relevance here is, as I explained in the buildup, is you know, we need, we need debugging tools at scale that have as abstractions, as notions, as concepts, things that make sense at the network scale, rather than at, at the individual kind of fine granular element scale. The background to Greece is coming from cybersecurity. So we're adapting ideas that are used uh, to detect and mitigate attacks in order to leverage the observability that they rely on for security purposes and direct them at improving debug ability and reproducibility, right? Diagnostic ability, elements that do not have a security character but rely on observability nonetheless. So this, this project is, has very recently been funded as of just two weeks ago and is a collaboration between Illinois Tech, SRI, and Georgetown. And you can find out more at, at our website, which, which uh, I'll, I'll expand on at, at, the, at the end of this talk. So how does, how does this work? Um, so I'll tell you a bit about very briefly what remote attestation is and, and how we adapt it to the network. So remote attestation is an idea where you have control over a remote resource, but you do not have physical access to it. So there are a couple of stakeholders here. 
there is a stakeholder who owns the equipment and who physically kind of contains the equipment within their, 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 their uh, premises. There's another stakeholder who's leasing and renting the equipment, but they have uh, kind of a weaker uh, kind of access to that, that equipment, right? But nonetheless, they would like some sort of assurance that what the, that equipment is doing on their behest is indeed what they expect it to do. So there is uh, this uh, mature field of ways of getting evidence remotely or about what that equipment is doing, as well as uh, even uh, having, having it do this computation confident, confidentially. So what we do in, when adapting this to the network is we have network elements um, uh, kind of leak in a systematic, you know, regular way, configuration information about uh, what program they're running, what state they're in, into the data plane with the data, with the frames that that are that are that those that work elements are processing, and in doing so, their peer elements will be able to see what their neighbors are doing and get a sense of uh, what what state their neighbors are in. And this is what we use to build a picture across the network of. Or that, that then we, we will use for debuggability. So this, this example you can see at the top is uh, uh, a packet shows up and gets switched. But in addition to that packet, we also emit a digest. And this digest can be as a separate packet or in other experiments, we've also kind of embedded that inside the original packet itself. So before I, I proceed, I wanted to give you an idea of um, a visualization that we prototyped that, that explains a bit what's going on. So what you're going to see going from left to right is evidence coming. So, so the, this, this is the digest that we saw on the previous slide. And what you'll see going from top to bottom are changes in state that are notable. So a lot of the time, the evidence will be repeated because the device might not have changed state. But as time progresses, it might have state changes. So these gray boxes means evidence is coming in and there's, there's nothing of note. It's still in its initial stage. And at some point, there we go, we'll see a blue box. So that's a, 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 an evidence packet came in. And the changes part of the diagram tells us that we transitioned from 0 to 1. And now it's another change came in. And we transitioned from 1 to 2. And these changes are being enumerated. right? So we've had two changes so far. And if we wait a little longer, we'll see some more changes coming. But the idea here is to get a bird's eye view of what a complex system is doing, right? And the highly summarized view. And this will show up in, in, in the demo that I'll show you later, where you will see uh, a more uh, kind of elaborate version of that, where we specify what, type, what, um, what aspects of the network element have changed. So in this case, what we're looking at here, we're looking at registers. So these are like stateful you know, variables you can have on the data plane, tables that control how the program um, is, 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 is behaving, and the program itself. We can think of this code as a, as a digest, right? as a hash of, of, those, of all those values. Um, and then what we see in change four is that the hash of the tables changes from this value, which was the initial value, to this new value. And then at step five, uh, we see that the registers change. So this is a very coarse grained view of changes, but it is our, our bootstrapping and you know, our, our starting point in order to make it more fine grained, lower its overhead, right? And experiment with, with various schemes to provide uh, programmable, uh, flexible uh, observability that we can leverage for debuggability. And what I'll show you in this talk is um, this running on live traffic and running on, on fabric. So before I get to that, let me uh, um, explain uh, the, kind of the, the base example that we're, we're going to be building on. And this is an example from my PhD student, Alexander, whose code you can see online at, at this uh, repo. And for those of you who have used fabric before, this is a familiar, but for those of you who aren't, um, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of decompose it a bit for you. So basically here, we're, we're going to create a slice. And a slice is going to be a set of resources that we're going to use for an experiment. Um, and this is done uh, declaratively. So we say, I'm going to create here by the red arrow, I'm going to create a new, uh, what, what happens to be a host, I'm adding a node, calling it H1, and then I'm adding a network interface uh, to, to that uh, node. And then I'm creating another node called H2. And I'm creating another node 
cool S1. Except that this node S1 is not quite a host. It's a, it's a host, well, it, it's a switch, right? So um, it, it has network cards or, or that, that are going to in, in, interface it with the two uh, previous hosts. So we will go to the yellow uh, arrow here. Uh, we see this linking happening. That's the uh, first or the zeroth interface on the switch is connected to the interface on host one. And the first element uh, interface on the switch is connected to uh, host two's network element. So here's what I meant by extensibility earlier. So this is a change that we, we made as part of that uh, first prototype. So um, we, we have a version of Fabric that provides you with some more abstractions that you can use to conveniently talk about attestation and evidence. Um, so this is derived from uh, the, the uh, repo that I mentioned earlier. And one of the uh, changes that makes possible is to talk about switches as switches. Um, so here we see, um, you know, the, we have a new type of method called add the testable switch, which has its ports declared. And if we go to the blue arrow, we see how the switch is being linked to the individual hosts, right? So this is kind of the delta you can see from the before and, and after and, and using the abstractions that, that we provide. And as far as Fabric is concerned, uh, you know, behind the scenes, we are interpreting what a switch is and what a switch is doing in a form that Fabric can already interoperate with, right? So, so we submit that slice and it gets assigned uh, just as the first example I showed you, right? So here in the middle, we can see the switch with its two network interfaces, each of which connects to a single host. So the cool thing about this is that it's kind of backward compatible, right? It's, it's additive to what Fabric uh, provides um, by default. So before I get to the, the demo, let me build up a bit more to tell you um, what program you're going to be see running and use that opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, what P4 looks like. So I'm going to start at the red arrow here on the left, where I'm pointing at uh, a type declaration for the uh, Ethernet header. So you can see that Fabric has some, kind of, some different uh, syntax from what we've seen in other languages, but it's also familiar syntax, right? So for those of you who've done C or C++, this looks a lot like an struct, right? Or in other languages, records. Except that this being a header, it must be serializable, right? So behind the scenes, the compiler won't do any packing, right? Or you know, uh, be, be under the influence of any alignment uh, co con co constraints. Um, as, as you might have seen it in, in, in languages like C, for example. So the Ethernet header has three fields. We have the destination address followed by the source address followed by ether type. Uh, the ether type um, is, the field is, uh, is 16 bits wide. And the other two uh, fields um, have, we use a type def, which we can see defined by this, by this pair below here, which is 48 bits. Um, so, you know, this is fairly intuitive. And then if we look by the blue arrow, we can see the header for IPv4 uh, being defined, albeit without options, right? It's possible to also include the options. Um, and the same process is followed. So basically we have uh, the, the width of the field and the name and, and so on and so forth. So now if we go by the yellow arrow at the top of the screen, uh, we can see we're gonna define our header stack. So our header stack is, go to instantiate each of the protocols once in this case, right? So we have ethernet, which instantiates the ethernet header and IPv4, which instantiates the IPv4 header. So now we can proceed to the first stage of what a P4 program does, which is parse the frame that has just entered the device. So you can think of parsing as we tend to think of it anyway, as being a very simple type of computational device, namely, uh, uh, an FSM, right, a finite state machine. And in this case, we have, as before, or, or an automaton, right? So we have a well-defined initial state that we're going to start on. And we're going to be defining transitions that are conditional upon the field values that we find. So in this case, we're going to always expect to parse Ethernet. And so we, we're going to extract the fields. Once we've extracted the fields, we can then do this case-like statements, the switch-like statements on the Ether type and parse the rest of the frame, depending on what the ether type is, right? So that we can conditionally um, uh, parse through, through the headers. 
So we, we, if, if, it's, if it's of a particular type that indicates that the Ethernet type is encapsulating an IPv4 packet, then we parse IPv4 and so on and so forth. So having parsed the packet, we're going to do something with it. And I'm going to start by showing you what, uh, what logic is being described here by starting at the red arrow here on the right side of the screen. So this is where the logic starts. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what the other parts mean by referencing them as we go along. So um, if we actually parse an IPv4 packet, then what we do is we're going to do a lookup on the table, right? So this is wherever you see apply, it's, it's going to be uh, a table lookup. And this just means that we're checking whether you know, we've actually uh, not succeeded in, in doing a hit. So we go to IPv4 host, we see this table definition here. And again, this is kind of P4 specific syntax, right? We have these keywords like table and so forth, but they're not difficult to, to wrap your head around. It's, it's, it's fairly intuitive. So we see a table as being look upable, so to speak, uh, using a key, where the key we're going to be using is the destination address. Right, so you recognize IP, the IPv4 instance from the header stack, the destination address, destination address field uh, from the previous slide, and we're doing an exact lookup. And then based on the lookup, we can either miss or we can hit. And if we have a hit, typically we have a specified action that we can take. And these actions uh, consist of either forward or drop. Now let's drop is it's pretty clear what it means. Let me tell you what forward means. Uh, we look at by the black arrow here, we see that there's forward action, which takes uh, some parameters, namely the source address, destination address, and egress port. What it does is it'll change the uh, source and destination address in the frame we're processing to be those of these parameters, which come from the table. Um, update the egress port to also be that in the table and decrement the time to live, right? Given that this is IPv4. And then what we see is that, you know, the, the, if, if we have a hit, then, um, you know, we're either going to take an action and forwarding or dropping. If we take a miss, then we're going to do another lookup, going back by this red arrow here. And we're going to do a lookup on this table called uh, LPM, um, which um, stands for longest prefix match, which some of you will know that that's, that's how we uh, do, do forwarding decisions on, on a protocol like a IPv4, right? So we see a different sort of criterion being specified here in this table um, by the orange arrow. Okay, so with that in mind, I'll show you the end-to-end -end demo of that program running on Fabric and using live traffic and kind of stitching together all these different aspects that we talked about uh, so far. So here what you can see is the code I showed you earlier is a screenshot, right? And I'm highlighting the, uh, the ports uh, that the switch has and them being linked to the uh, hosts. And this is output from Fabric that tells us that some resources were allocated and what I'm highlighting now are the, the switch related ports that are highlighted, right? So I did not use the Fabric's um, uh, inter uh, kind of call, the add node call in order to um, then build a component and you know, define an interface, but all that is handled in the background by this extension that we built. And what I'm showing you here is that you know, we, we, we created this um, um, elements called an, an attestable switch that has extra properties, right? So it behaves not, not just as a node, um, but it also has these extra properties that we can interrogate. So examples of this, of these uh, properties, right, are you know, additional methods that you can call to load a program, given that it's programmable, and you can run commands from the control plane, right, so from outside the, the data plane, but influencing how the data plane is operating, right, or else polling the, the, the data plane. So um, in this case, uh, what you're seeing is I'm, I'm, I'm interrogating to see what tables are running here, right? So these are the two tables that we saw in the code earlier, pv4 host and pv4 LPM. And in this example, I'm, I'm highlighting table entries. So we saw that the full, what, what, let me break this down for you. So here I'm adding a table entry to the IPv4 host table. So that's the first table we looked at. Um, if we match, so we're looking for an exact match of this IP address, then we're going to take a forward action, and the parameters to the forward action are these three values here. Right? So these were the source and destination address, 
and this was the egress port here. So, so this, this glues together that um, code that we were looking at earlier and explains what the parameters are. So we've now added these, um, uh, the, these table entries to, to the device, and we can also use another command to, to dump uh, the, uh, the, the table entries from a particular table, and that should show us what, what we've previously entered, right? So, so the two, uh, the, the two uh, pieces of syntax would correspond. And now we come to the uh, demo involving live traffic that I mentioned earlier, involving uh, that uh, evidential screen that, that I showed you earlier. So now we're going to start seeing traffic as before, moving from left to right. And we can see initially kind of what, we, what the initial values are, right? Those three blue dots, uh, one of each of which corresponds to um, the, the three pieces of um, change that we, in, um, that, that, we, that we can see here, right? So registers, tables, and programs as before. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to make some changes on the switch, and we'll see these changes being reflected. So we're going to, I'm going to add uh, a table entry. The, the value, exact value doesn't really matter. We'll just see the, the change come up. And then later on, I'm going to add uh, ch change a register. So there I added a table entry, and we can see that table has changed from that hash value to this new hash value. And next, I'm going to read the register. So I didn't tell you much about registers other than they're, they're these stateful variables that persist on the data plane. I can see that the value is 1. I'm now going to change it to 2. The change has gone through. The evidence change has also been observed. And we can see that the hash value has changed. Now, the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read the register value. It was previously 0. I changed it to do. And now I expect it to be 2. And there it is. So that's an end to an example that kind of connects together the pieces of the, the project that, um, that, that uh, I was describing in this talk and that encapsulates P4 and, and observability. So before I, I get to questions, um, there's, there's a couple of things I wanted to do. So first, I wanted to give a huge thanks to the many people who have enabled this research. Um, uh, you know, th there's an expression that it takes a, a village to raise a child. I believe the same can be said for developing research ideas. So huge thanks to, to students who worked with me and I've highlighted amongst them here, uh, students who worked on remote at the station, right? So Chunsuk, Nishant, and, and Alexander. Um, I also like to thank uh, students who took my networking course last semester, which involved both Fabric and P4, and um, you know, it was a very interesting experience to find out how to you know, find ways of um, explaining uh, networking concepts in, in that very flexible environment. Um, and I also wanted to thank my collaborators across various projects um, from various institutions, and more broadly, people who uh, you know, Help through feedback and advice from a variety of other institutions, right, including the SNET, Sierra Logon, of course, Fabric, and, and the P4 communities. And finally, NSF for, for funding this work. So finally, the last thing I wanted to mention is invite you to participate in Crease. As I mentioned, this is a project that just has, has, has just started. And we have an early prototype that we're working to release as a first beta, a public beta. Um, you're very welcome to join our mailing list. It's, it's no traffic. It'll keep you up to date. And it'll, um, it, 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 it'll allow us to get feedback from you and, and kind of co-design, co-build co, co that, that prototype, as I mentioned. And finally, uh, if this sort of thing interests you for, for research reasons, then you know, if, if you're interested in doing a PhD, then, then do get in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sotana. Um, so now we'll move into the Q&A session. Um, so uh, we'll uh, answer some of the questions that we received uh, from the audience during the talk. Uh, I'll start with the first question here. Is there a way to visualize the network topology created in Fabric uh, with a picture or something with all the switches and servers? And how were the animations in the video created? Thank you. So yeah, so Fabric has uh, provided you with a couple of interfaces. So there's the programmatic interface uh, that I showed you that, that we use very heavily. Uh, there's also the web interface that's um, also 
it allows you to have a lot of control over your slices and over your resources. And it also provides you with a visualization of uh, your, your resources. So in one of the slides, I briefly showed a topology. Um, one was in Utah, one was in GPN, and one was in Max, where there were, there were these, these different resources. Um, so that can already be done in, in Fabric. Uh, as for my my animations, I, uh, I, I, uh, I I'm I'm kind of semi obsessed with with visualization, and I, I wrote some software that that does that. Um, and if you you're interested, reach out because there is already, I, I, some years ago I'd worked with some students and released um, some uh, some some code based on a game engine that that visualizes um, that, that, that visualizes uh, experiments like that, right? So in 3D and you can rotate it and it runs on your browser, so you don't need to install anything. Thank you. So uh, if you're interested, make sure you contact uh, Professor Sotana for the cool tool. Um, the second question, what type of task is P4 suitable for and what task is it ill-suited for? So P4 is um, mostly and, and best suited for header manipulation. It's less suited and, and you know, the, the cutoff is quite steep for anything approaching payload processing. So what we looked at in that example involved inspecting the values of headers of, of those, those two uh, protocols, right? So one was Ethernet header, one, one was IPv4, and making decisions based on those values. We didn't look inside the payload. So P4 is restricted as a language by design to uh, not get into, into the payload. There's other ways of doing the payload processing. Um, so, you know, so for example, a, a header-based firewall is totally you know, fair game to attempt to write in P4, but something like DPI, right? Deepak inspection that, that uh, tries to piece together what, what a, a zip file and an email attachment contains, for example, um, that does not the best fit. Having said that, it's interesting to contemplate what it would be like if you were to try, right? So there were two projects um, I, I worked on and one involved extending um, so writing P4 programs that have a notion of um, uh, fixed precision uh, rationals uh, or, or as a subset of the reals. So, uh, and, and also having functions like logarithms and sign defined on them up with, with, a, with a statically uh, chosen um, precision. So, so you know what, what the precision is and what the overhead is for running those computations. And we were looking at this as a way of, uh, you know, trying to shoehorn new logic into existing, uh, into existing infrastructure. And the other idea of similarly kind of a, uh, some kind of, kind of a, uh, an envelope pushing nature was parsing uh, English. Um, so, so, and using this to, to, to uh, kind of parsing of, of emails, for example, or short messages, which before is not suited for, uh, but it's interesting to think, you know, what would it what it be like if if, if we tried, and um, then use that to uh, see what other problems come along. Right? So this can inspire things like maybe extensions to P4, maybe offload opportunities that we can better characterize what the interface is like from the P4 side to the non P4 side. So if anybody's interested in in those, I, I do do reach out. I'd be happy to to give more specific pointers. That's great. Um, the next question. How do I start learning P4? So there are quite a few good, uh, quite a, a few good examples and, and, um, and tutorials of, of P4. So I would start with um, the tutorials that are uh, available at uh, or linked to at P4, the P4 websites, so P4.org. Um, at, at conferences, uh, you also sometimes find P4 tutorials. So it was the case at SICOM for, for a number of years. Um, I think there's also P4 related uh, workshops at, at, at Fabric uh, related workshops as well, um, P4 tutorials, I'm sorry. Um, and also Fabric has a great set of resources uh, related to starting to use P4, right, uh, um, particularly from the University of South Carolina. Um, and uh, all of that provides a great stepping stone to learn P4. And finally, do check out your networking courses, right? So I've, I've taught P4 in three courses so far. And, um, something I find is that since it involves programming, um, it's, 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 it's approachable by students who don't have all that much network experience, but they can leverage the programming experience and intuition 
to then learn networking through the lens of, of programmability. Thank you. And uh, there's one more question here. Um, what qualities would you look for in a future PhD candidate? Wow, where to begin? So one one thing is, is tenacity, right? So um, it, it's it's it, there, there are these these skills that uh, come come together in order to uh, to to create you know interesting you know, research and, and and tenacity is because you need to um, you need to find something that's new, but also you need to persuade others that it's new and it's worth persuading, right? And and you need to make choices. It's an opportunity cost, right? Do I work on this? Do I not to work on that? So that, that's something which is difficult to, uh, you know, you can't really learn it from a book. That's kind of more of a transferable life skill. But in research, I find it's absolutely uh, essential, right, to, uh, to uh, it goes back to what I mentioned at the beginning, right, about patience being an important uh, quality in, in research. Um, obviously, technical skill, right, and the, the ability to stomach a lot of detail is very important in, the, in this field, given the sometimes low-level nature of the artifacts that are built and the, you know, the attention to detail to, um, to understand why things are working the way they are and why they're not working the way they, the way they are. Um, and then another quality is, is communication. Um, so uh, technical communication as well as kind of group communication, right? It's um, the research does not happen in isolation, right? It, it happens, um, it's, it's a community effort. Um, and so it, it's vital to be able to, um, you know, very, uh, um, in a very, uh, calm and, and very constructive way, collegial way, um, develop new ideas and, and collaborate, even when, you know, half of the time you might think you're wrong, right? Because you never quite know, right? So you have to, you have to, you have to navigate that space of technical and non-technical qualities, but it, it seems to produce uh, very good results, not only for the PhD, but also for beyond, right? Because one of the one of the things that uh, I always think about um, is what happens you know, to the student after their PhD, because there's a whole life ahead. So it's good, it's good to start to think about uh, about that from from day one, right? To to prepare to excel in some career that the PhD can enable. But but uh, you know, so the PhD is a means to an end, but not an end in itself. That's great. Um, next question: How do I start using P four on fabric? So um, I would start by looking at the uh, knowledge base. So the, the fabric knowledge base, which is uh, accessible through, um, to, to, the, to the main fabric website, has uh, a, a section on programmable networking. And, and within that, there is a variety of resources, including the ones I mentioned earlier from, from South Carolina. Um, there are resources that uh, we worked on in collaboration with ESNet on how to use uh, P4 on the Alveo cards that are deployed on Fabric. Um, and there's also there's also a, a, um, a tutorial you can look at and, and some, some starting materials uh, that are all linked from, from that area. Um, and that provides recipes for uh, for, for how, how to get going. So I, I would start with that. And, and one of the nice things I found from working with quite a few students on using P4 and Fabric is that um, the, the test bed is, is a sort of kind of unifying force, right? It, it's it's uh, regardless of, you know, whether the student is using, you know, Windows or some other operating system or the laptop is two years old or six months old, right? So um, it, it creates a very helpful... Um, homogeneity and this is helpful when it comes to debugging things right because one person in the team might say but it worked on my system right but it didn't work on another person's system whereas having fabric and having you know, these sort of scripted uh, experiments and using the same infrastructure and having kind of self-contained resources helps a lot so so when it comes back to kind of learning before in fabric it, it takes away some of that unnecessary kind of spinning your wheels while, while trying to figure stuff out, like how to compile the tool chain, for example. Thank you. Uh, the next question gets deeper into P4 programming. How is the debugging of P4 programs done today? 
So uh, to, today, there are, uh, there are tool chains of P4 for different sorts of targets. Um, so the one I showed you um, was a reference uh, switch uh, that has a compiler that produces um, blobs that that reference switch executes. But there are also compilers for uh, the, the switch I showed on the second or third slide. Uh, for, for the network card I showed on the same slide and for other types of hardwares, uh, hardware. So um, in that case, what you usually find is that within that tool chain, you have a way of um, inspecting what the program is doing. Um, and you, you have a, either, for example, a simulator or, or some way of running the, the, uh, the, 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 the program in an environment that might not be the, the actual hardware, but allows you some introspection to understand what it's doing, right, without actually uh, actually deploying it. Uh, and the, the, uh, that, that is helpful, but it's also, again, from having worked with several students over several projects, it can, it can be very testing to, to patients, because if you have a network with multiple switches, uh, you know, it, it, you are working with a distributed system, right? So think about, you know, when you know, people are learning how to program with threads, for example. And it's not quite threads because it's not quite, it's not shared memory, but, but you have that concurrency that, that's, that's happening, right? People have to navigate, right? Um, so uh, to, to today, the focus is very much on the, the fine granularity of individual um, in individual elements. So to give you more of an example um, for, for the ESNet framework, um, so you can run a P4 program uh, using uh, an equivalent of that software switch I, I mentioned earlier. So you feed it a, a file that, in, uh, that, um, that, that uh, encodes some, some network traffic, some packets, and it produces a file that is what the switch would have produced after processing that. And then one layer down is you can run an, an RTL uh, simulator. So, so you're simulating that the, the, the hardware of that, um, of that particular element. And then, another, and then you can simulate the integrated hardware and then ultimately run it on the FPGA. Right? So um, it offers you more choices, but you are still bound to a single device. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. Um, since Crease adapts uh, remote attestation, can I use it as part of a security system? So, so in, indeed, Crease uh, uh, it, it kind of transposes ideas from security, um, so so concepts from security and, and uses them for, for for debuggability. And what it does is it exploits the observability observability that is enabled by by the, the security ideas. And, and use that to leverage what we can do with, with programs um, and understanding programs. A big difference is that increase we don't have a threat model, whereas in security, you have to have a threat model, right? So in security, you have to have some articulation of what are the capabilities of, the, of, of an adversary or adversaries, um, you know, and, and how, how might, they, might they be able to subvert control using, using those capabilities. Um, so, so the security side of things is, is, is a good deal more complex. In, in Chris, it's a bit simpler. You can still kind of have a bit of a Byzantine situation, right? Where, where, where one side isn't quite sure what the other side is doing, but at least we've taken kind of malice and, and kind of threat out, out, of, out of that equation, right? So, um, so, so to, 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 the, to the question, it, it is, there is a path to get there, but it, it involves a lot more work to try to pin down what the you know, threat model is and how that's how the threat is going to be mitigated. Sure, uh, and we got an audience just squeeze in another last question. Uh, what advice would you have to someone who finds coding difficult? Is P four programming a good place to start? Um, so my general advice for for someone who finds coding difficult is to, to try to unpack it conceptually, right? So um, try, try to think about what's happening. Try to, try to think as, as, you, as if you were the machine and you're just following rules. Um, and that can really help unpack that, right? So I don't know if people have, might have come across the, uh, the is it called the, the rubber duck uh, debugging? Um, so what happens is it's, it's, it's somewhat childish, but actually it works. 
So you have a rubber duck and you're explaining to the rubber duck what you're seeing on the screen and what you think is happening. So in doing so, kind of slows you down. It gives you more time to interpret what, what you're seeing and to unpack what you're seeing. Um, and oftentimes, you know, that creates, it highlights kind of gaps in understanding or assumptions or loops of logic that are being done that might occlude our initial understanding of what was happening. So that's, that's the first thing I would do. I think before, if I understand, if I understand correctly, the question was, you know, is P4 good as a first language? I, I wouldn't suggest P4 as a first language simply because it, it carries the overhead of understanding what the network is doing, right? And concurrency. I would start more with something like, like Python, which, which provides great introspection, you know, and, and kind of a very mature environment for that initial, initial stepping stone. Sure. Thank you. And uh, the finally, one audience asked uh, if. Uh, uh, how how can I reach uh, Dr. Sultana? I believe the links we share in the slide deck will have the Chris Project website, and that will link link to uh, Dr. Sultana's uh, contact information. Yeah, okay. exactly right. So the the slide deck has links that ultimately will have a link to me. Sure. Well, thanks again uh, for Professor Sultana's uh, nice talk today. Um, so um, we'll uh, now probably move into some. Uh, final information for the audience. Um, so there's lots of resources uh, to help you get started using Fabric and also um, to get started doing P4 experiments. Um, so feel free to uh, consult these links. Uh, and if you have not uh, signed up for our newsletter, you're welcome to do it on the Fabric website. Um, there's office hour. If you're doing experiment and come across some questions, uh, you want an actual person one-on-one uh, -on -one discussing with you, feel free to sign up for our office hour. Um, so we have our website, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, feel free to uh, take a look at that. And for those of you doing research experiments, we highly encourage you to look at the fabric matrix. Um, this is a form that we uh, work with all the fabric users to collect uh, your research stories. So uh, we can use that to understand how better to support your research, but also uh, help promote your research when we find the opportunity. Um, so please uh, consider doing that, uh, fill out your matrix. Uh, if you are using Fabric to publish papers, well, we will welcome you to cite uh, Fabric uh, in, in your publication. Uh, so going on uh, to the next slide, So uh, we'd like to, uh, in addition, thanking Professor Sotana again for giving uh, uh, the, the talk today. This would not be possible without a lot of uh, backend support from the team. Um, particularly, we'd like to thank um, two core members uh, putting this together. Uh, Chelsea Davis is the Fabric Projects Project Manager, and Jay Sri Jagannatha is our social media specialist. We'd like to thank uh, them uh, very much. Uh, next slide. Um, so uh, we welcome you to consider uh, attending more upcoming webinars. In August, we have two more. Uh, one is called Stitching Together Innovation with Fabric Users with uh, Dr. Yokan Chong, who is a um, research uh, professor at uh, uh, the Argonne National Lab. And then August 20, at the three o'clock, you're going to have a Mastering Fabric Tips and Tricks webinar that's focused on network interfaces, uh, what, which will be led by uh, Professor Paul Roof. Um, so thanks again to everyone and uh, hope you get a lot out of today's webinar.